It's time once again to slip into your camo, grab your bow, and join us out in the field for another episode of the Up North Journal, presented by PSE Archery. The Up North Journal crew is knocked and ready to rock for another exciting adventure. So let's step outside and hit the trail. This episode of the Up North Journal podcast is brought to you by PSE Archery, Yamaha Outboards, Better the Hunt, Easy Cut, Packer Max, Deer Camp Coffee, Buck Bates, JPO Game Calls, Limwalker Game Calls, Wild Seasoning, Total Peep, Sunrise Archery, Scent Lock, and Scent Blocker. Welcome back to another episode of the Up North Journal, everybody. I'm host Mike Adams sitting in the cabin tonight with Danny Red Defaw. We are on a Wednesday. Yeah. How you like this weather? Uh, no. no. A little chilly? I'm, I'm not digging it, man. Last week we were sweating, not, muggy, hot. Yeah, not to mention that I, I'm, I'm in a mood tonight, and it doesn't start with G. <laughs> so what he does in the meantime is he goes gets himself some fresh cold brew. That's right. I'm going to be more jacked up than uh, some southern boys on Mountain Dew. <laughs> That's right. And you know what? We took a poll last week, and nobody wants to try the cold brew. I don't understand that. I tell you what, I'm I'm all about this stuff. Hey, Tammy, what's going on? Good to see that you're on the stream tonight. Uh, yeah, I this stuff is starting to grow on me. I tell you, it, I, I'm liking it. It's going up north with me this week. I've got enough to take up north. Excellent. That's a cool thing. Yeah. You know, it's it's. But I will I, be taking the regular Deer Camp coffee with me. It's gonna be a little warmer this weekend. Yeah, but it's supposed to be wet. Oh, is it? Yes. Oh, gotcha. You're going to be kayaking, right? Uh, we might be doing something else. I don't know. Your well, audio's on, I think. Not, not me. Uh, we're my, super st- my staticky. Audi- hmm. My audio's off. You know, I don't know. Hey, Tammy, how are we sounding out there? Are we staticky? Right? So, I hope not. I'm tired of chasing audio problems, especially with the mood I'm in tonight. So. You are <laughs> in a mood. So, But I tell you what, uh, let's take care of some quick business. Absolutely. You keep talking there about quick business and let me get my... Uh, uh, my my uh, menu up here where I forgot to get the quick business up. All right. Well, let's start off first with uh, our people who support us. And we want to mention Buck Bates. It's getting to that time of year when you can start getting things ready for the woods and, and getting ready for deer season. I mean, what? Bow season's less than 100 days away, I exactly. think, here in Michigan. So it's, yeah. it's not going to, or it's going to be here before you know it. So make sure you get over to buckbaits.com. And if you use our Up North Journal, promo code you'll get 20 percent off your order down there are, are you ready to take over there yet danny you're not i am you're okay i am that's what you know what like we talked about you know we talked about the weather cold well folks you gotta start looking towards your fall food plots what better way to do that than using the packer max uh get on over and talk to lincoln roan there at packermax.com you can get 25 dollars off your order by using the promo code unj25 there you go and i tell you what Tell me what. I'll tell you that you need your game calls. All right. You know, and what better way is to check out jpogamecalls.com. Check out all the calls they got, whether it be for deer hunting season or maybe do some little coyote hunting. Uh, Use the promo code UNJ10. You will get 10% off your order over there. And what can we use when we get said game? Ooh. What you can use is uh, an array of... Of different seasonings that you got to try over at Wild Seasonings, wildseasonings.com, exactly. And if you use the promo code UNJ2021, you can get 10% off your order when you check out. And we talked about it the cold brew, even some hot brew, uh, Deer Camp Coffee. That's right, folks. You want 10% off your order, use the promo code UNJ10, get 10% off your order at deercampcoffee.com. Right here. Got it in the cup tonight. I lost my slate. I'd have had it up there sooner, but I I know where it's at. I, I've rearranged some stuff on the computer, so I didn't have the slate up there. But trust Danny what he said. Use that promo code. So Mark Coleman says, having dinner, we'll be back in a few, and the fish are biting. That's a good thing. Right? Gotta like that. Absolutely. The fish so. are biting. And I like dinner, too. So. All yeah. right. So. Last week. Last we week. We announced. That we were going to have uh, Melissa on from Yamaha, and unfortunate things happen, and she's not able to join us tonight, so we have to go to plan B, C, D, and E. And have we got a show for you tonight. Right. Ex- hey, Lincoln Road, what's going on? Exactly. Speaking of Packer Max. Speaking of Packer Max, Lincoln Road is in the house. Uh, you know, we have 
and Lincoln Roan is gonna love this. I know what he is because it's controversy. He just yeah he loves that Facebook jail and stuff. Oh, yeah. uh, but it seems that trail cameras seem to be. I like trail cameras. You do like trail cameras. They're kind of neat. You can set them up in your backyard. You can set them up for hunting season. You can have them going all year round. That's right. Hey Eric, what's going on? But man? Eric, but <laughs> you say Eric, and then I go ahead and almost call him out. Um, but it seems Arizona has decided to ban them. Period. All cameras will be banned. I've already I've already had this whole discussion, and I'm saving <laughs> most of it for this show. But uh, this, 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 go ahead and so, go ahead and tell the good people who are watching and listening about so, this ban. This was from Field and Stream. I picked up this article just nine hours ago. And uh, in their June 11th meeting, and this will take effect January 1st, 2022, uh, basically what they have done is Arizona has decided that all trail cameras violate fair chase. And they are hitting the hunters with the the country's first full cam Ban. And as and, we talked earlier, you actually told me that there's, what, two other states that have and partial bans right so now? So there's two other states out there um, that have partial va- bans on game cameras that they're not allowed to... Um, use during hunting season. Use during hunting season, yeah. What states are And those, those are out out there. Uh, and I'm, I'm reading the article, folks, as we go here, so bear with me. Um he didn't do his homework. I did my homework, <laughs> but I was trying to keep you off your 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 soapbox. But yeah, so there's a couple other states out there: Nevada, and I know Nevada was one of them. But yeah, Utah seemed like Utah. Uh, Utah. Utah Who was one, was it? and right. maybe Montana or Wyoming. I can't remember. Another there's there's two or three. Anyway, so go ahead with the ruling. Arizona becomes the first state to ban trail cameras statewide. Statewide now mm-hmm. for hunters, not just during the season, pre and post rut scouting as well, basically year round on public and private land. So once again, the government's sticking their big toe into private land use, telling us what we can and can't have on our land. They said that they posed an immediate threat to public health and safety. Wait, Be- that has nothing to do with fair chase. Oh, well, hold on. It says right here. But the headline is talking about fair chase is the reason they did this. Right. Actually, it started last October. The process began last October when the governor approved an unscheduled emergency rulemaking period based on claims that the trail cameras posed an immediate threat to public health and safety Hmm. because of conflicts over camera placement, including disagreements on social media. (laughs) So it's kind of like gun control. So So, so the cameras are, are the ones at fault here. It's not the people that are being idiots. So instead of taking care of a problem uh, that involves people and their actions, we're once again taking care of the inanimate object that actually is being used in said confrontations. Well, it kind of, not going to lie here, folks. Yeah, Lincoln, what a load. Yep. You know, but um, it's kind of funny that they're making a ruling based on on a perception. The, a perception of disagreements on social media. Yeah, yeah. I've, so isn't that just natural? If I don't like what you do and I object to what you do, I might say my piece, you say your piece. And, yeah, and then we're going to make everybody take their toys and go home what, once again. What's that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Keep going. Right? Now, you might say, wow, they banned it. What was going on? So they received public comment about this. And... Um, there was 1,845 comments about it, mm-hmm. with 1,019 opposing the ban. Opposing the ban. Uh, so, yeah. So, their concerns were that the trail cam technology may create an unfair advantage for hunters, competition and conflict between hunters at water holes on public land. That doesn't say private land. Kind of like when you put a tree stand up where there's not where there's confrontation there as well. Right. Or, or a ground blind. But isn't here in Michigan, if you're hunting on public land, mm-hmm. isn't the courtesy rule of thumb is, oh, you're there for first. I, yep. I, yep. Now, granted, you can have people that will sit right next to you too. I get it. But I was always taught, hey, there's somebody there. Back off. Yep. Find another spot. Yeah. Right, Lincoln. Lincoln says, I wouldn't be shocked if the MDNR did this. Seriously. 
Right? Well, this is kind of why I, I saw this article during the week, and I said, uh-oh. Because this just opens the door to... It, the, it, fair it, chase, the fair chase argument to me just doesn't hold any water. Um, you know, they're, they're talking about hunter conflict, you know, or, or the technology is progressing too fast. With today's technology, trail cams can send photographs to your phone, so guess what? You're not out in the field having to check said trail camera interrupting somebody's hunt if you're on public land this doesn't even we ain't even talked about private land use yet but for the public land so we're going to take trail cameras out so okay if i've got a late season tag and what am i going to do i'm going to now that i can't use a trail camera i'm going to scout and let's talk about out west because this is kind of where this is coming from you got an early elk hunt you got your mid season elk hunt and then you got your late season whatever tag you draw if I'm a mid or a late season and, you know, they're worried about the guy going out and interrupting those early season hunters by checking a camera. Uh, like I said, probably most people are going to use that cell phone because the technology is getting so good and so cheap now. That in turn is going to put all of these people out scouting when usually on the weekend when most guys are out hunting. You're going to have people tromping through the woods, scaring the game. So to me, it, it's going to it's going to have the the opposite effect of what they think they're trying to stop. Well, sometimes that helps you though, depending on how the situation works. Having other people out there mm, moving the game around moves the game around. For yeah, you, obviously, yeah. right. So okay, so uh, that's conflict, uh, competition, and conflict between hunters at water holes. Uh, disturbing wildlife by frequent visits to set and check trail cameras. So they're not going to disturb wildlife while they're out scouting. So are they not allowed to go out and scout in a public land? Uh, nope. Other issues include disturbing livestock that are grazing on public lands. Same thing with hunters. So, hunters so doing the same thing. What if you go for a nature walk? Yeah. So if I can go out with my dog and I can walk on state property and... Do whatever I need to do. Hey, I've got hunter's orange on. I'm being safe. I'm just out walking my dog. I'm not a hunter. I'm not bothering you. Over in Port Huron, many years ago when I hunted over there, it was during season. Mm -hmm. And she would ride her horse right through the hunting. Yeah. I've seen it. I've seen it down in Brighton when I was hunting down in Brighton. Okay. Same yeah, thing. She, Horses she put, come through. She put orange on her horse. She yep. was wearing orange. They've got the right. They, it, it's public land. Exactly. I've been turkey hunting over at the state park where you and I first started turkey hunting. I had people walk right through between me and the decoys. There you go. I've had them walk up too. Bird hunting, you know, waterfall hunting. People, you know, coming through in, in kayaks and canoes and, and rowboats. You know, oh, look at all the flock of ducks there. Oh, wait, oh, those aren't real. Oh, those guys are hunting. You know, same, right? you can't stop it on, on, pri- or on public land. And last but not least, the taking of pictures of pictures of people without their permission. Mm-hmm. That, with me working in the media, I know this law. Unless there's a direct law that says you can't do it. When you're on public property or in the public domain, you have to expect that people are going to be taking photographs, movies, etc. You have no right to privacy out in the public. That's, that is, that's in the... uh, You looked it up. I looked it up, yeah. That's in your, your, your constitutional rights as a broadcaster or as a person just taking photographs. You can take them of even p- private uh, businesses, like if it's a, a tourist spot, okay. things of that nature. There is no expected right of privacy on public land. So that, that doesn't even hold water. Okay, so... So not, I don't not, understand where, where this is coming from. Right. There's, there's been no scientific data or uh, research done exactly. to prove this. Yep. So with this ban, Montana and Nevada are the two states that prohibit during the fall hunting season. And Utah is considering similar rulings. Okay, Utah was similar. Yep. Okay. So it, if, it's, if it's public land and they want to say, okay, we're not going to allow you to have them out there during hunting season because we're afraid you're going to bump other hunters. I could almost see that a little bit, but I, I don't see why year-round, you know. What's the difference? Okay, they're talking about disturbing game, you know, and other people out there not wanting their pictures taken. What's to stop me from taking and going on a nature walk and going, oh, wow, there's there's a there's a bear over there. I'm going to take a picture of him. I'm going to take a picture of that deer, that bird. You know, there's bird watchers. They do the same thing. Yes, they do. What's the difference in a camera sticking on a tree versus this thing? 
that, right? Other than the fact that I'm not there to man it and I put it up and I put it on the tree. And as long as I'm not screwing it into the tree, if I'm just anchoring it to the tree with a strap, I'm not harming that tree. Uh, you know, and, and let's, let's take it to the private land use. I use them a lot on our property up north here in the past, the last three or four or five years because we're doing land management. They are a great tool to understand what you have on your property as far as your, your fawn recruitment rates. There's trail cam studies that you do to be able to understand what kind of the, the ratios you have of buck to does and be able to manage that land. It, it's a great tool to make sure that your resources that you have in your game are not over browsing or destroying your habitat. It's to keep things in check and balance. And now you're going to take that away from those people that have private land? Well, what have you done also? By doing that, you've gone in, you've set your camera, and you've left. So for the next however long, if you have a cell camera, you're getting the pictures. Right. Or if maybe you come back in a month. You haven't just, you've actually left the game, Mm -hmm. actually all the nature game in the area alone. Right. You're actually out of the area just going, okay. Letting it chill. Yeah, letting it chill. You want to see the, you know, you want to see it. And they're saying, well, that's, no, 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 that's not right. You know, and Eric uh, Dabbs brings up a great point, you know, and, and actually Danny and I talked about this before the show. Cameras on private land are nice security as well. And that's my point. So if I've if I've perceived that there's a problem, like say maybe I'm hunting close to a property line that maybe butts up to state land and I've lost a couple tree stands in, in the past, but I don't want to give up that hunting spot because it's a great spot. You know what I'm saying? It's it's you know, it's the go to spot at a certain time of the season where you know bucks are traveling. And you want to put a camera up to see if you can catch somebody stealing your gear, making sure that you try to get that face uh, recognized so you can turn it into the DNR. What's the difference between a trail camera and a security camera, and who's to say which is which? Well, that okay, that's a very good question. And Lincoln Roan even says it here. He's kind of getting to the, you know, it's they absolutely cannot tell you that you cannot put a camera out on your private property privately owned property it's bad enough they think they can tell you you can't feed wildlife right the overreach is out of control absolutely and the people that are making these decisions nine times out of ten are are not hunters uh they're not outdoorsmen or women they're they're bureaucrats who've been appointed to these positions they have no business making decisions on on game and wildlife and habitat when they don't understand it and they don't understand the science Exactly. And Eric Dabbs even says it may open up more trespassing and poaching on private land. Because yeah. there won't be any worry that how many people have posted on Facebook that we've seen people walking in front of their cameras, you know. It, what who, what who, do bands do? Bands usually create more problems when, when you ban something. Just like in certain cities where there are, are gun bans. They are not allowed to have a, a firearm or to be able to conceal carry. What happens then? Then all of a sudden, boom, when you take that away, you have crime that skyrockets. You know, just like you said, poaching, uh, poaching is going to go up and stealing of your uh, your tree stands and things that you've got out there. It's just, it's insane. Well, in the city of Detroit, they've got that network of cameras at, at certain areas in the oh, city. Oh, but the government can put them up though, right? And spy on us. Ding, 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 ding. So... In this debate that they had on June 11th, they took public comment. Uh, Joshua jo- Josiah Scott of the Arizona Sportsman Trail Camera Defense Fund uh, made a point. Uh, he asked, actually, he's a- he actually asked for data. Mm-hmm. Give me some data. Because he said, you know, everything I've heard here today is people's emotions. There's no science. It's feelings. Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, they don't want you fighting on social media. Well, then they need to get rid of social media. <laughs> That's, right. Hey, if there's a problem with social media, then we need to ban that too. You say, he said. Lincoln, I'll probably be joining you in Facebook jail for saying right? that. Right? <laughs> um, so Josiah said, hey, I've hunted Arizona for 53 years. Have never had a significant threat or was afraid for my safety over a trail camera. You say someone is going to get hurt. Somebody is going to get shot over a trail camera or a social media disagreement over trail cams. That is a lie. You are perpetuating words are not guns. Yeah, they're, just, they're just trying to uh, add fuel to the fire on their side and, and use, like you said, an argument of feeling uh, or, or perception of feeling better about oneself, of banning something. It's the same way with firearms. You know, it's, it, it doesn't make you safe. You know, we want to make people feel safe. That's I hear it all the time, whether it be a school, whether it be, you know, uh, some kind of government institution. We want people to feel safe. Well, it's not about feeling safe. It's about being safe. There's a big difference between the two. Right, exactly. And they considered other alternatives to a complete ban. 
such as maybe instituting distance restrictions around water sources, uh, limiting cameras to certain species. I don't know how you do that. Ron, uh-huh. you bring up a great point. You know, uh, Proposal G doesn't pr- protect Michigan hunting like we thought it would. You know, and that's a great point, you know, back when we put that in. Right. Something's got to change. Creating units for seasons for their use. You know, maybe take a county or something. Say, hey, none of that. I, you know, if you want to do, like, primitive hunts. Okay, so no no trail cams during primitive hunting. Okay, I can go with along with that. You know, because you're promoting primitive-style hunting. Right. I, I can see that. Right, right. Uh, establishing a camera registration and label system. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Now we're going to have a, a camera registry. <laughs> right. And by the end of it, they decided, you know what? We're just going to ban it all. Wow. So um, how are we doing on time for the segment? Uh, we went way long. So if you want, <laughs> let's take a break. We can come back and finish this up, and then we'll see if there's any questions out there. All right. We step outside. We'll be right back after I dust off my soapbox. All right. Yes. PSE Archery has reinvented the way you buy bows. From now on, you can make the most educated decision possible by basing your bow choice specifically on your shooting needs and goals. All you need to do is ask yourself, what kind of shooter am I? What do I want to achieve? PSE will help find the right category for you. So, what kind of shooter are you? Find out at pseartery.com. I need some more cold brew. Get me amped up a little more need, here. Get you all amped up. It's been a while since I've had, had a good dust up. It, it has. It really has. I need these every now and then. So yeah, it's it's. This is one of those articles that you just kind of you kind of just. I don't even know what. I guess I'll say you like Tammy did. Omg, really? Well, what else? I mean, they banned our our bullets. They they want to take away certain firearms. Now they're going to ban uh, cameras. Uh, I know in certain states you're not allowed to hunt with uh, in, on a, in bow season a, an electronic device on, on your, your bow. Yep. It can't be an, it can't be a, a lighted sight. It can't be a lighted knock. Things of that nature. It's just <sighs> where does it end? You know what? Exactly. It, it's next thing. Range finders will be illegal to carry. Well, right now we can't use deer scent. In the state of Michigan. Well, yeah, they're working on that one, right? It, you don't yeah. So look, yeah. For, look for more on that later. Like, like you said, like you said, they're looking. They're, they're, as a hunter, you go out and you scout for your game anyway. Absolutely. When you do that is when you have free time. Yeah. If it's during somebody else's archery, archery season or whatever their season, you so do it. When, it's public land. It's public land. You do it when you can do it. You know. You know. It, it just. I. I'm having a hard time. It, it would be interesting. The one about registering your cameras would be pretty funny. I'm not. And Eric lie. says, "Yeah, and don't forget, in some states you can't hunt on Sunday. Still, yeah." Uh, I think Pennsylvania is one of those states, if I'm, if I remember right. Right. As it's on, and maybe, or is it West Virginia? I can't remember. Uh, I, I think one of the Virginias just got Sunday allowed to hunt. In, tur- in Turkey season, some states you can't hunt past one o'clock or noon, something like that. Right. They do that a lot for turkey seasons. Yeah. Tam says, make it illegal and the problems will be solved. Yeah, that works spectacularly. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Nancy, hey, get out of my woods, right? Get off my river. <laughs> you know, I just oh man. Well, get out of your get out of my woods. Exactly. Now, uh, what what where does it stop after that? Where you know what? We... I just saw something come up. I want to give a quick shout out to uh, FM 123 up in Newberry. Speaking of the the great woods of up north, uh, let's 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 kind of shift gears because I can beat this horse all all night long. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to it. So, what's going on in Newberry right now? We gotta give them a quick shout out here. All right, Newberry, where it is a balmy seventy-eight degrees. Seventy-eight degrees. Yeah, I think it's warmer up there than it is down here, actually. Oh, let's go back to full size. There we go. Uh, it's a bit windy up there, and you know what? Deer Camp Coffee is served at Cedars. Cedars up there, where they have great pizza. So you got to get on up there, check it out. That's up in Newberry, Michigan. And if you're up there, get you some Deer Camp coffee. Absolutely. So, you know. Cold brew. Right? So there you go. Check that out. I got to get me a cold brew maker. You've got one. I want one. We'll get you one. Don't worry. Uh, we'll brew up some concoctions. So, yeah. So, you know, I found that article this week and I was like, really? 
You know, it's it's been a little bit too quiet lately. I mean, not that I, I want to see things like that, but I mean, you, you need things to kind of get you amped up and, and make sure that you, you're, you're still engaged in the outdoors, make sure you're still engaged in the political scene, making sure we're fighting for our rights. You know, when, when things kind of, it, it kind of scares me when things start to get a little quiet. Because you wonder what's, what's, what's going on behind the scenes, you know, what's coming down the pipe, how bad's it going to be. But when you're in the fight, you're amped up, you're passionate about it uh, because we care so much about it, you know, especially, you know, us outdoorsmen. Uh, it's not all about the kill. It's, it's you know, about preserving outdoors for generations to come. So Right, exactly. Uh, Ron Moses gives us a compliment. It says, so far you guys are the only ones that actually call out the DNR. Some of the biggest voices in Michigan back down. Uh, besides Uncle Ted, he does that. And uh, Ron Moses, who is out in Colorado, uh, he went from 100 to 62 in the mountains. Nice. Yeah. That's a good temperature swing. Yeah, he's, he's just but, you know, I, getting back to what he said about, you know, people not calling. You know what? I mean, why go lockstep? Uh, you know, At, working in the media, I, I feel it's our job to call certain things out. Um, not that all media organizations do that now. There's too much. Uh, and it's, it's on the left and the right both. And I'm not getting political here. I, I, I keep it in the middle here. But the point is, we're supposed to be the watchdogs. You know? And when I see something, You're and if I don't agree with it, I'm going to say it. That's why I was taught to ask questions. Yeah. You were taught to ask questions. Yeah. Ask why. What's wrong yeah. with asking why? Yeah. You know, What's and, wrong and, with the trail camp? I, I, I've, yet to, I've yet to see that article point out one thing that... A trail camera does that causes issues. Well, like like the gentleman said, he says... Where it needs to be banned. Well, he says, uh, Josiah, of the uh, Arizona Sportsman's Trail Camera Defense Fund. He says, <laughs> give me... Read that again. The Arizona Sportsman's Trail Camera Defense Fund. we got to have a defense fund now for trail cameras. Oh, my God. Right? And he, he asked for it. He says, give me the data or science to back that up. If they had data that says the livestock or whatever they're claiming is happening, if they had data proving it, then put it up on the big screen. Go, here you go. Right. There it is. Right? And then you'd have an argument. But to say things that might happen or potentially, do, do they have a, uh, a DNR report of a conflict over a trail camera? It, do you? you? You probably got more of stealing Stealing trail cameras. Trail cameras than you do conflict over them. Right. Absolutely. I, again. You know, that's the, that's the old adage of people that put trail cameras up on public land. They're like, well, you know, we hate to say it, but you get what you get because you know there's idiots out there that are going to take gear and steal gear. And you, you take that risk when you put a camera out. You do. Even the, a tree stand or whatever, you know. Even on, I'm not going to lie, even on proper, private property. We've had a bunch of ours stole. I, I had... I had Two man stand take a to, take a walk off our property. I had a tree stand uh, taken on one piece of property we used to have, but we also had, like I said, we had a bunch of cameras taken, and we found out why it is because somebody was running dogs illegally at the wrong time of the year. Oh, uh, they were doing something against the law. Law, and actually, they they got caught. We got our cameras back, uh, but that's what it was: is they took them down because they knew they'd be caught. They didn't want their faces seen when their dogs were running through. And Ron Moses has the. 2021 science doesn't matter. It's flat out attack on lifestyle of hunting. It's attack of the lifestyle of anything that you it's, you don't agree with. It's it, according to that. It's other what side. they're saying that uh, blah, 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 blah. we have the commission has to consider the quality of a hunter's time in the field. Why why do they have to consider it? What you do with your time of field, what I do with my time of field, that's totally up to me. Exactly. If, if you want to go and, and... What about the bird watcher's time of field? He can't go out there and, and take pictures? He can't go out there on that land? Exactly. They're talking out of both sides of your mouth. You know, he states, he states that confrontations are only part of the problem. That's when he said about the quality of Hunter's time of field. It's like, well, wait, why are you determining my quality? Just let me do what I want to do. Within the law. Exactly. And. All right. We've spent a half hour oh, on this. Man, it just. It, the more you dive into it, the more. The it worse just, it gets. The it, more it just. 
you know what? And I, I really feel bad for the people of Arizona that had to put up with this. You know, actually, what we need to do is we uh, we got a buddy out there that works at PSCR. We got a few of them out there that, that actually uh, got quite a few. <laughs> might uh, might have some input on that. So, yeah. matter of fact, we're probably going to have them on here. Uh, we're, we're probably doing the next couple months before yeah. it's hunting season. Have them on. Get I'm their sure take on it. We'll get their take on it. And it's one of those things. See, I don't know, but I they talked about. I'm going to go back to the quality of time of field. But part of the quality of time of field was the kids grabbing the game cameras. Okay, where do you want to put it? And letting them decide to see what we can see. It was all, and we were out there. Yeah. We were outdoors. Yeah, but it's private land versus public land. So, all right, where are we going next? Uh, where are we going next? You, my friend. I'll tell you what. what? We're halfway point of the show. Okay. Let's run this segment short. We'll go ahead, and then we'll make up for the first one. And uh, we'll step outside. We'll take our next break, and we'll be right back after this. PSE Archery has always dominated the speed category. Now, the most revolutionary cam system ever to hit the market has perfected the shooting experience. Introducing PSE's Evolve Cam System, featuring extremely high let-off capabilities and the smoothest draw cycle in history. No other cam system has ever delivered this level of total comfort and total control. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Welcome back. Third segment of the show. Um, I take it we're talking about... What do you got up there? Um, Where are we going? We're, we're... Dead silence? Yeah, that's dead silence. I mean, like, I'm, I'm waiting for my page to update. Well, what are we going to talk about? What we're going to do is we're going to show something on the screen here that Up North Journal is... There oh, we go. I know what you're talking about. Yes. All right. So, so, so I got to just have my page load. While he's doing that and getting it ready... We have officially become a supporter for the first time of a race team. The Up North Journal is a supporter and got our decals on a race car. Absolutely. We are proud sponsors of the number six goat cart of JP Racing. Out of and Lansing? Out of Lansing. And he is, the racer is Joseph Jr. Jr. Um, he will be six. In July 7th. This cart belongs right, to a seven. five-year-old kid. That belongs to a five-year-old kid. and So in about 15 years, we can inspect him on the NASCAR circuit? Well, actually, I'm thinking more like F1. Oh, okay. So uh, so there you go, folks. We're sponsoring, or, we're sponsoring so, a race car. Or supporting a race car. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. Well, however you want to call it. So has he won races yet? Are, are we spending our decals wisely? We are. Okay. He hasn't won, though. No, he's learning. Mm. He's he's moving up. He he is racing the likes of the Roushes. Bumping elbows with the Roush team, huh? Yes. Seriously. So, seriously. He is the they're the, the, the Roush grandkids are out there, I guess, with it. Full race suits, stacks of tires. Uh, right. Yeah, no doubt about it. They there. got backup carts in case they crash one. Right. Off the back of the hauler or the trailer. <laughs> Amen to that. So. Okay, so I see what you got up here. Yes. Uh, Pop, can you can you make that full screen at all? Uh, if you could, please. Let's if you see. remember, guys, a couple weeks back, uh, I was talking about a kayaking trip that I actually... Oh, here, let me just put that up there. If Hold you on. Pop full I'm, screen, gonna, I'm trying to find the first picture. And we were on the Chippewa I'll River. Go here. I'll make that the first picture. Um, oh, that's full screen right there. My girlfriend and I and another gentleman went out on the river, and we spent five, six hours... We canoed about six miles. And if you remember, I, I was talking, and, and we wound up coming across probably 50 to 100, maybe even more, of dead suckers, a fish. You know, th- that was the only species that we saw that was actually dead, either floating in the water or on the bottom of, of the uh, the river there. So, and we were wondering, like, you know, what's caused this problem? Is, now, this, is this, it species-specific? If I remember right, this is not a very deep no. Overall. No. We got hung okay. up quite a few times, actually, while we were paddling, uh, going down the river. You know, and anyway, long story short, you know, we were wondering, and my girlfriend Nancy actually sent me a link to another show, a radio show here in Michigan, and people were com- commenting on it about that particular river and the fish kill and what was going on. And somebody actually had posted on that thread and said, in that river two weeks prior or a week prior to when we were there, that the DNR had actually done dumped a bunch of poison in the river due to uh, a, a suspected invasion of sea lamprey. Oh. So 
they actually dumped some poison in, and they said that poison sucks the wa- the oxygen out of the water, basically pushing the lamprey, killing the lamprey, and pushing them out of the river. It also does that to the wildlife or the the fish. Well, yeah, because that's they need to. Okay, so you know, but they, we saw some fish in there. Not a lot, but we saw some fish that were that had survived it, and a bunch of minnows as well. Okay, so basically, the the when however they do that, it's probably an immediate in that general area. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. So, so it, it must dilute itself mm-hmm. through the water. Oh, did I say canoe? She says kayak, not canoe. See, I'm still jacked up on my cold brew here. Right. But yeah, we were we were kayaking and. Uh, there, there was, there was I, what I perceived to be an overabundance of dead fish, and if I'm, if I remember correctly, the person who posted that was also kayak and, and, and mentioned the same thing that, that they had seen some, and, and then they had seen the DNR dumping the right because so. we have that naturally occurring as we come out of uh, when we have ice. When, the, when some lakes get that all that oxygen sucked out, they, you'll have a winter fish kill. Right. So, but. Uh, well, it's good that they're going after the lampreys and getting those out of the... You know, and that's that's like right, I mean, right by Central Michigan University. I mean, that's the Chippewa River. That's the nickname of the college is the Chippewas. Uh, I find it, I was shocked that sea lampreys were that far inland, inland on these rivers, yeah. that they've actually got that far up. You know, I actually caught a sea lamprey on some bait uh, in the Sheboygan River. Really? Right downtown Sheboygan, yeah. This was... On a Memorial Day trip up north to Mackinac with the kids, like fifteen years ago. Really, ten years. And you count fifteen? Were you, you, yeah. you purposely trying to catch it? No, no. Oh, okay. No, I mean you know reeling it in, like, well, I got something, reel it in, and you know, really, he had latched onto whatever we were using for bait, and you know, got it loose and let it there on the on the grass. But you know, when you hang onto it and you pick it up, the head of that thing with the mouth is the sucker part, and then it, it would latch on with the teeth and take yep. a chunk of it. It was like. It was hard for me to like hold it. It's like it, you ever tried to hold like a, uh, a gyro, yeah, and it fights against you. And it's trying to, it's actually trying to latch on to something, yeah, right. Yeah. So wow, you know, and it was I don't know, probably foot and a half long, you know, yay, you know, inch and a half, inch, well, inch and a half around. You see pictures of people posting fish that they've caught that they've mm-hmm. got the scars from, right? That uh, and as soon as they snag, snag is adult, it's poison time. I got you, right? You know, it's. So that's what they're oh, doing. Oh, see, Nancy said that too. People wade in that water all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's people swimming. Man, and you thought leeches might be bad hooking on you. Yeah, I've I've had that problem too. Oh, I know. I've had leeches on me. I, I, yeah, I've had that happen to me. But imagine us. The waters of Michigan have critters that you don't even know about. Right. Exactly. So. Wow. So but that's what it was. Yeah. So they were so. after. They were trying to go after the lampreys. That's kind of cool. Yep. Cool. 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 Um, but yeah, but. You're heading up north this week. Yep. And we talked about, uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about boating safety with Hunter Bland. Mm -hmm. And we always talk about hunting safety, Mm -hmm. uh, bow safety, hunting safety, uh, tree stand safety. What about your travel trailer safety? Yeah, well, as you well know, two years ago, we had some stuff fly off of the truck in front of me and go through my windshield and nearly take my head off. I had something fly out of a boat. Luckily, it was a plastic dustpan and disintegrated on my windshield. And we see on 75, a lot of times, in the median or off into the giggly weeds, uh, the Lattic, remnants of a trailer. Yeah, remnants of a trailer or other parts off of trucks and cars or things they're hauling. But, yeah, you know, I've been thinking a, a little bit this week. I, I joined this, uh, this, fo- this forum about uh, travel trailers and, you know, specifically the one that we've got. And, you know, you start reading things and you hear the horror stories. You know, I mean, you hear the good stories too, but you know, those are the ones that stick in your mind. And it got me to thinking, you know, that I was, oh, it was a couple of weeks ago, I think we were coming back from our last camping trip. And when I parked the trailer, I, I, I told Nancy, I said, you know, I need to, I really need to check the tire pressure on these tires because that truck, that trailer's probably got six to 800 miles on it, you know, and you wonder, you know, do things come loose? Do things, you know, how are things running? Even though it's fairly new, it's only two years old, two and a half years old. You just, you wonder about those things. And, you know, it, to me, it looked like the tire might be a little bit low. So before we take off, I'm going to check the tire pressure. But if you remember, uh, was it, it was it two years ago, we were doing the series following Tread on his Get Off the Couch tour. Absolutely. To Alaska. This, this, this it, we talked about this pre-show and I was like, 
you're right. This is the, exactly. Remember, we went, saw where they built the trailer. They yep. put, slapped on the brand new tires. Yep. And it was less than three or 4,000 miles. He had a, a severe blowout, didn't he? He had a severe blowout, and all four tires were wore to nothing. Were pretty much crap, as he, well, politely we say. Yeah. He said a lot more. But yeah, and he's like, this is a brand new trailer, and I got to put new tires. Four new tires on it. Right. So. Well, in the forum, that's what I'm, I'm reading. You know, a lot of people that are buying campers these days, RVs, what have you, they don't come with the best tires on them. I mean, obviously, they, you pay a lot of money for this stuff, and you wonder what kind of gear they're putting on it, but these tires are not lasting very long. In the end, they're saying this, you know, a lot of people. So a lot of people, when, as soon as they buy them, I was reading the forum, are actually pulling the brand new tires off, getting rid of them, and putting brand new ones on. You know, it's something that's going to last and be uh, a little more roadworthy. And a lot of people are even saying that they even they even pull better, or they don't get that. Like when you get into a, a camper on a new one, you feel that bounce as you're walking in it. Right. They say it's because the sidewalls aren't as thick on those tires as they are on a good tire. Hmm. That's and, an interesting thing. And uh, and they're saying a lot of these tires are coming from a country that uh, a lot of people believe give us coronavirus. Right, exactly. <laughs> they, well, that's you can a, figure that's that one a whole another story. Right. Uh, but that goes for regular utility trailers, too. Now, the difference is uh, I know Lincoln, and I know mm-hmm. I've ran into this problem, but like you said, making sure the tire pressure, because mm-hmm. I left home, but when I loaded up, you know, I saw, oops, I need mm-hmm. to put some air in those things. But, uh, yeah, you're right, Ron Moses. If you let them sit for a long time, they do get dry rot. Yeah, that too. You're not supposed to let them sit with direct contact on the ground when you store them over the winter. Exactly. So after you coming out of the, the winter, it, you got to inspect your tires. Yep. Well, and, you know, the other part of it that goes with it is the, uh, they said do an axle or a bearing inspection right out of the factory. A lot of people are finding out that they're not packed correctly. They don't have enough grease in them. And all of a sudden, you've got a hub that, that welds itself together while you're on the road, causing an accident or basically flat spotting your tire as you get pulled over to the side of the road when it actually welds together and stops. So Right, exactly. And then, uh, obviously, the first thing you do is you walk around your rig to ensure that everything is safe, especially if you've got slide out. Yep. Make sure you slide them in. Yep, yep. We've heard of stories of that. People going down the road with a slide out actually out. <laughs> right. So, but no, it's also like at work when I drive the truck at work, uh, we have to do safety inspection on everything before we actually take off. And I'm, I'm generally pretty good about that, even with the trailers, you know, plug them in, make sure all the lights are working, check my tires, you know, check the lug nuts, make sure that those are tight. Um, but, you know, they're even talking about bearings and, and, and packing bearings more frequently than, you know, you would actually think. Uh, they also said pay very close attention to the type of grease you use. You use what's already in there because if you start mixing greases, uh, types of greases that don't belong together, it can actually cause more problems than not doing it. Oh, so absolutely, because the, the consistency or the makeup of one grease over the other grease could cause... Yeah, I think lithium, non-lithium okay. chemicals <laughs> that, that don't interact well with each other. So, uh, yeah, it's just I'm these forums on Facebook, and I'm, the more I'm reading and seeing things that are happening it just starts making me think a little more critically of the gear that i'm using and and doing stuff with so well your number one fan says that is why i will continue to pull the kayaks and drive separately and i check that trailer before we leave as well (laughs) and ron moses says that his wife does the same thing pulls the pulls the kayaks and drives separately yeah well i mean it's I drive slow with mine. That's that's one thing about pulling mine with a Jeep. Um, that's the other thing, making sure you don't pull something that's too heavy for your vehicle. You know, whether it be a boat, whether it be uh, an RV or a snowmobile trailer, know the towing capacity of your vehicle and know what kind of hitch you've got on. Make sure you've got the right cl- size, size hitch cl- or class of hitch. You can't be too safe. And that's the thing is I don't go just booking down the road 90 miles an hour. You know, I drive, I drive relatively slow with that thing to make sure that we get there safely. So... See, Ron, Ron Ron has seen a few Jeeps with trailers in the ditch when he's I, seen that. Well, I've seen it. I've seen it all. I've seen, really. yeah. And the thing with, with mine, it took me a long time to find a trailer that was light enough that I could actually pull with the Jeep. Correct. You know, I did a lot of research on, on the capacity, the towing capacity of that thing, the hitch that, that was on it and what I needed. And you just can't go out and buy something. Matter of fact, when I went and picked that up, they would not let me drive away from the dealership with that trailer 
unless I had a vehicle that was capable of towing it. Weight capacity and hitch and everything. And that's awesome. I like that. You know, and running with trailer brakes. And you know, and that's another thing, you know, make sure you know, test your brakes before you leave. And 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 now Nancy Nancy is about ready to bring the tent because you have her in a death trap. <laughs> She don't have to worry about long as she's either in front of me or behind me, ways behind me. So. Right? Uh, Ron Moses, he knows this better than anybody because he is a long-haul trucker. That weight distribution Absolutely. is very important. Yep. And you, yeah, and that's the other thing. You're talking about loading, whether it be a boat, uh, you know, putting gear in your boat or on a snowmobile trailer, enclosed trailer, you're hauling whatever. You know, it's it, you can't load too heavy on the tongue. You can't load too heavy on the back. It's got to be distributed. You know, they told us 60, 40 on, on a trailer when we start loading things and don't go over that, that limit. Exactly. And he gives you some advice. He says uh, a cooler is too heavy for a Jeep. Come on, man. Must be a Jeep thing. Come on, man. But uh, absolutely, especially if you're, in his case too, in any case, how far you're going with that trailer and and good point eric uh, you know talking about hitch stabilizer sway bars uh you know we've got them on ours as well uh highly highly recommend that along with trailer brakes absolutely you know it's uh like i said it's not just campers i mean although we every year we see two or three of them blown apart on the side of the highway uh but i see a lot of boat trailers oh, eric, this time yeah, of year with a hub, with a hub pulled off it because you know that backing them in and out of the water it takes a toll on the grease and on the bearings. You know, you got to pack them things regularly as well. Yep. You know, and for goodness sakes, when you're hauling stuff, make sure stuff is tied down inside, especially in the boats. Like you said, <laughs> right. stuff come flying out of a boat. Uh, that was the most, that, that just happened right after your incident. So that was like slow mo, but then it went into a billion pieces. Um, but yeah, and isn't it amazing when you're pulling a trailer? Don't you feel like a magnet? People want to just become. Oh, like yeah. Cutting you off or, yeah. or pushing the brakes right in front of you. Pull in front of you and then hit the brakes. I know, right? You know, I know Ron Moses has seen that a hundred times a day. Probably. All those big tractor trailers just cut right in front of them. They'll stop. Yeah. What I want to do is pull in front of a, of a tractor trailer fully loaded, running down the highway at 70, and pull in front of them and hit my brakes. Right? Uh, it's like, really? You, you think that's a smart move? No. <laughs> you know? No. Well, you you, you got to wonder what the person is thinking doing that in front of a, a person pulling anything well it just goes to show you this time of year people are excited to get outside they don't think they're in a hurry to get wherever they're wanting to go whether it's to up north what have you we see it all the time exactly oh so just I, my, slow down a little my cousin who pulls a 29 footer mm -hmm. same thing gets out you know he's in the right hand lane just cruising and he's got people jamming on the brakes in front of him wow Ron just said he saw a U-Haul on top of a, a Jersey barrier in Denver. It, <laughs> it was a Jeep. Thanks. <laughs> You're instilling a lot of confidence in me tonight, Ron. Come on, man. Right? Um, so. Like he says, every day that happens to him. It does. It does. So it just, word of the wise, folks, get out there. Check your gear up before you hit the road. Check your gear. Rolling. And Lincoln Roan, I think, has run into this as well because he's pulling his trailer with his Packer Maxes all around. I know he went off to Wisconsin, I think, yep. the last time I saw. You know, it's just. <sighs> Slow it down. Just shake your head. All right. Last break here. We're going to step outside. We'll be right back after this. Y'all, stay tuned. Acceleration is part of PSE's DNA. PSE pioneered the speed movement. Now they've developed the Vapor category to help you find the most powerful bows on the market to fit you. High speed equates to intense power and building the momentum you need to be successful. Are you a Vapor shooter? Find out at PSEArchery.com. Welcome back, last segment of the show. We got Danny on track. We got some pictures to show. Um, was this Sunday? This was Saturday, actually. I'm just going to let you... Saturday before the... Sunday, we had the big rain. Sunday, okay. Yep. The day before Father's Day. Right. Did you have a good Father's Day? I did have a good Father's Day. I um, was taken out to lunch, and then I went, and um, we did our annual Father's Day putt-putt, and I retained my... Championship. Championship. In other words, they let him win again this year. <sighs> I'm telling you. You let dad there win. There is no letting in putt putt. You got to go full out. Oh, he goes full out. They let him win. Ah, oh, boy. It's just the way it is. Come on, man. Tell the truth. It's it's the truth. All There's right. There's no letting. So you went out Saturday evening. Well, we went out Saturday morning. Just kind of back up just a little bit. We took grandkids out 
the two oldest, five or almost five and almost three. <laughs> we took them out. Uh, Nancy and I took them out for their first kayak trip. We uh, we hit a river that was extremely shallow, about a foot foot and a half deep the whole way. Uh, but we got them out on the water. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, that was that was the day. That was Saturday before uh, Father's Day. Okay. And we got to about twenty minutes before the end where we were going to take out at, and the rain hit, and so the umbrella. We only had one, and of course Nancy had it. So she put it over baby girl. Right. So it, was, it looked like uh, you know we were uh, in uh, in Venice, you know, where you got the little gondola and they're carrying the little parasails <laughs> and stuff. It was really cute. So, uh, but anyway, before we got to the end, she fell asleep. Really, ba- baby she, girl. She not, fell asleep. Yeah, in the baby kayak. girl, not Nancy. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so then the, the umbrella got passed over to uh, Ben, my grandson, and he carried the rest away in. So, but afterwards, you know, kids went home, whatever, and we're sitting there, and I'm like, you know, the wind direction is just about right. I said, what do you think about going and hitting the bay, the big water? And we went out to catch the sunset on the big water. And the sunset you did catch. Oh, it was beautiful out. I mean, well, it, look how calm the water is. It it was. We're we're fairly close to shore here, but when we first went out at about seven in the evening. You know, we were out there. You know, probably a good half mile offshore. Okay. You know, a lot further than than these were the pictures here. But uh, yeah, it was fabulous. It was just beautiful out there. You know, and we pretty much had that whole little area to ourselves. You know, and we we paddled up river or over to uh, Saginaw River and went up the river, and took me. She took me over to uh, this uh, old lighthouse that they're renovating. It was really cool and got some cool pictures over there. As a matter of fact. The, what, it was what, so what, creepy looking. It would have made a great place for our, our horror film. Oh, nice! <laughs> what, what what are these in the water? Those are ducks. Okay, those are ducks. Yep, right. way off there in the distance. Yep. So, yeah, we got some good photos. Absolutely, had a good time, and uh, I was actually that was my first trip out uh, on the big water. So, oh, the family of ducks. Yeah, it was all good. So, had a good time. And there you are catching the sun. I'm trying to hold the sun up to, so we can enjoy the sunset just a little bit longer. Is that what it was? You're trying yeah. to hold it up. Yeah. How'd so, that work out for you? I burned my hand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a great time, and you know, being new to big water kayaking, I mean, it, it, it. I was you know a little apprehensive at first, but once I got settled, it was it was nice, you know, and had all the safety gear and everything uh and since we're talking about safety you know make sure you have your pfds uh make sure you have any gear that you think you might need you know uh we we had cell phones with us obviously right uh you know she had the first aid kit in her her boat or her kayak you know and the one thing is is the evening kind of went on and i didn't think anything about it but we've talked a lot about it this week is you know the sun's starting to set and she's like you know we're gonna have to get going pretty soon I'm like, I just want to catch it just when it hits the horizon, you know. By the time we got back to the, uh, the little boat launch where we put in at, it was it was dusky dark. Pretty pretty dark. You know, and it's like, you know, we probably should have lights with us. You know, number one to be legal on well, the water. I don't know. It's not a motorboat, so I don't know the, the specific oh, law here in, in, in Michigan. So I've got to read up on that. But just for safety purposes of going down, you know, down a river or out on the bay, either one. You know, you, you need to be lit up to where other boaters can see you. Exactly. Because, obviously, we don't move as fast as a motorboat. So, along with that, I learned some things. So. And Nancy says, wait till we do the bridge. Yeah. You know, it, it's one of those things. It's just, you, you get out there. Like you said, it gets dark. It gets dark on the water. Yeah. Well, speaking of the bridge, she's already kayaked across the Straits of Mackinac. Um, and she would like to go from St. Ignace to Mackinac Island. Okay. And, and we're using 14 and a half foot kayaks. Yep. Uh, and we just read online this week, somebody went from St. Ignace to Mackinac Island in a small 10-foot ten, ten kayak. 10-1? A, rec- a recreational yeah. kayak. And it's like, you know, what are you thinking? You need the bigger boat for the bigger water. You know? Well, it kind of kind of goes hand in hand there, right? Big yeah. water, big boat. You know, and, and we're, you know, we're, we're, we've been talking a lot about marine radios. Uh, we've got bilge pumps with us, handheld bilge pumps in case you do take on water. You know, the bigger boats, you know, you get a spray skirt. So it, it, water splashes, you need to take a bow wash. It doesn't fill your boat full of water. Right. It rolls off, you know, um, a wet suit or dry suit. You know, there's all these things that I'm learning about and she's teaching me as that's the one thing. Hopefully this week when we go up, uh, we're going to be on some inland lakes and okay. I'm going to get some more experience in, in the bigger waters. And, you know, and the other thing about the, the kayaks that we're using is we've got rudders on them that are foot controlled. 
So you've got a lot more steerability so you can point, you know, and, and crack the waves in the right position versus getting them rolling over. Oh, and, right, right, and, right. And, you know what I'm saying? You can orient yourself in, in the right way before you get in some serious trouble. So. And Ron Mo's Ron Mo, a flare gun. Flare gun, yep. And what about the current? Uh, the current up on the bridge is going to be kind of interesting. It's she's already done this this trip, the the bridge trip, and and that's one thing we've talked about as well uh, is how that current runs there. And at the bridge, you've got mixing current, so it's like a washing machine. Yep. You you've got to know, you know, that's why you, number one, you go on calm days and know which way the wind's coming from and know what the weather is before you even venture out. So there's a lot of trip planning, and that's the one thing I'm really learning. So, but we're I'm I'm growing in baby steps. So that's how you do it, right? Yeah. You know. Oh, flare gun, got it. Yeah, it's just uh, certain. Boy, things if she ever gets about. ticked off at you, you're gonna be running from a flare gun. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I see how that works. Uh-huh. But yeah, no, you know, big water is a whole different ball game than a, well, a lake. It, it's no different than pulling a trailer or gear with a vehicle that's. The right size. Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. know know the limitations of what you're using, and and don't exceed those limitations to put yourself in in harm's way, and be prepared. Just like this one thing I did this week, I I took tools and I've got I've put a kit together. I'm putting tools in the camper. You know, I keep saying I need a toolkit. I need a toolkit. I need a toolkit because you never know what you're going to run to, and you have to fix while you're at the campsite or what have you. So I I've got a full set of wrenches, pliers, screwdrivers. The whole nine yards, you know, metric yep. and standard. So that way, if we, you know, have any, some small repair I need to do, I can do it. That's why I take a, I take a regular jack, a floor jack with me when I go up north. And that's something I'm undecided on yet as to what I'm going to do. I, I, I've got the one with, that came with the Jeep. I don't, I don't have a jack yet. But I got to thinking, the worst case scenario, if I have a tire that needs changing on the camper, I can run the jack stands down and put, put my, I got blocks that go underneath them. I can put them on the side that I need to change. And run right, those jacks right down to get it up to where I can change a tire. Right, exactly. Worst case scenario. Right, uh, exactly. You can do that, and it just for me, it, it's easier just to get out the floor jack and throw it in the trailer, and it's going with me. There you go. It, it, it's just. It, I don't want a floor jack rolling around smashing things inside the camper. No, I tie mine down. <laughs> I, so. I, I, I use a bungee cord, tie it to the side, and it's good yep. to go. So, uh, and Ron Moses is going to live through you on your adventures, obviously. How's that? Because he says, I'll live through you guys. Oh, (laughs) he needs gas. (laughs) And he needs gas. He's got to stop and get some fuel. Right? He does. So, hey, Ron, while you're out there, uh, type in real quick, what's the price of fuel out there? Regular unleaded in the area you're in. He said he's in Colorado, right? Yeah, he's out at Colorado. $2.95 for regular unleaded tonight. I got it for. There you go. I've been shopping. Right. So, I guess the moral of the show tonight is... You know, summer's here. It's upon us. You know, let's go have some fun, but let's be safe doing it. That's that's all we, you know, we really wanted to get across tonight. Uh, we've kind of been talking a little bit of safety here in the last couple of weeks. You know, yeah, we talk about Hunter Hunter you can never talk enough about safety. Yeah, you know, it you, started well. Look, look up at Tack. Some yeah, Jack Wagon was shooting behind, behind us, the shooting line, yeah. shooting at the kids' target. Yeah. Out, they, I'm not gonna lie, they should have had a. I don't know. I thought they do, but I don't know if they had a range master. Range masters, but I don't know if they do actually. I know they got them down where they're uh, doing the the shoot, the uh, the fun shoot, or the, the win the truck shoot. Yeah, but I don't think that, I don't know if they have a person that actually is eyeing the situation. Well, they didn't that day we were there. No, because that guy didn't. was behind us and shooting behind it. He was a good ten yards behind the whole line shooting. <laughs> yeah, he was two eighty a gallon. 280. Yeah, it's not bad. No. Compared to what it is here right. in Michigan, anyway. But, uh, yeah, so so I seen uh, JPO game calls. He had a treble hook in his finger. Safety. Um, whether you're out on the water, up a tree, doing something, think safety first. Because um, things are going to happen. That's one thing at my company that I work for. Uh, we have a safety message every day now. And whether it be from, from bee stings to yeah. crush zones in the plant. Right. Everything in between. It's all about safety. Well, even a bee sting can kill you if you're allergic to it. You don't have an EpiPen. Absolutely. So. That's that's one of those things. And and that just kind of resonates back home. Now I, I wear hearing protection when I cut the lawn. I, that's something I haven't started yet, but I, I've thought I, about it. I definitely do now. And, you know, wear gloves. And I have a hard time watching people cut their lawn in flip-flops. Open-toed shoes just... I don't... Or barefoot is another yeah. one that just... Whether it be riding more or push more. That just gets to me. Yeah. I just picture those toes going. Well, 
quick story here before we go. Uh, outdoor related. I was cutting grass when I was younger. This I would have been. This would have been before 1980 when we moved because I remember the house it was in it had a deep ditch and it had a little steep embankment that come up to the roadbed. And I was push mowing and I had turned around and went down down the hill and I was going to come back and I was going to pull it back up because I was cutting that side. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Seesawing it. And when I turned around to step, my foot slipped and went under the mowing deck and wham. And my foot, yeah, got hit by the blade. And luckily I had tennis shoes on and it hit it hit, hit it just at the end and took the end of the shoe Holy off. Holy mackerel. And I'm, you know, it's like Fred Flintstone. You went bink, 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 bink with the toes to make sure <laughs> right. I had all five, you know. And uh, it, it hurt, but it didn't cut me. Thank, thank goodness it didn't cut me. But yeah, it took the end of my my shoe off. Wow. So yeah, word to the wise. You know, it just wear the safety gear, wear your tree stand harness <laughs> when you're in the tree stand. Uh, you know, your safe zone of fire. How many guys we know got muzzle blasted? Oh, yeah. Whether they're waterfowl hunting or whatever. You swing that muzzle, know where you're yeah, swinging it too. Nope, I totally get it. So yeah, have fun out there in the outdoors, but take a but, half second to think before you do something. Yep. And then don't go to Arizona and use a trail camera. You got to the end of the year. Don't go to Arizona to use a trail camera. That just blows my mind. See, aye, aye, aye. It'll be interesting because next year at ATA, I'd like to stop it and see how this goes from here. If, if more states pick up on this or whatever happens, just to talk to the the game camera people at ATA. Say, yeah. Hey, how yeah. is this? What? How is this going to affect you guys when the whole state now just bans it? You know, I wonder what the population, not that it matters, but I wonder what the population of hunters is in that state. I mean, well, I mean, they've got a big game out. I mean, they hunt coos deer. They hunt javelina. They hunt elk. They've got elk, an elk range out there. So, I mean, there is big game out there to be had. So, you know, it's not like, you know, I, I shouldn't say Hawaii, but Hawaii, you know, I, I know they got pigs to hunt down there. I don't know what else they've got to hunt. Probably birds as well. But you know what I'm saying? It's just... There's there's a plethora of big game and small game to hunt down there, and trail cams are used. 269,000 people hunt in Arizona each year for a total of 2.6 million days are spent hunting in Arizona. I wonder what uh, Michigan deer season alone, we have, what, uh, probably close to 3 million tags, or I mean 300,000 tags sold. 300, well, let's see. 400,000 tags. I mean, now the actual kills are probably upwards of the 200,000. 700,000 hunters, but that... Right. That's all hunters. Is that tag sold or is that actual... They probably don't break it down that way. Tag sold versus actual hunters. You know, because, I mean, I'll buy, you know, two doe tags, uh, a buck tag, and then uh, a turkey tag, small game license. I mean, that I'll wind up with five or six licenses trapping. You want to know people or tags? I just wonder how what that number was. When it says 700,000 hunters, how do they break it down? But yeah, so they they said there was seven hundred and fifty one thousand deer hunting licenses. Okay, there you go. So you put Arizona and Michigan together. That's a million. Pe- that's a million hunters. So you know how many of those people use trail cams, and how many of them have multiple cameras? I mean, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna have a, a huge impact if uh, this thing starts taking off across the United States, like so many things do. So, so basically, what they do is they take a hunting license sold. And they, that's a licensed hunter. Yeah. So that's how they come gotcha. up with the number. So that's anyway. How break it down. So. All right. Well. All right. I think we've had a good show. Yeah. We put one together. On a two-hour notice. Right. <laughs> but things happen. It does. They all People happen. have emergencies. And you know what? It was good to see Lincoln Ronan. on. I knew that first story would just kind of wind him up. Yeah. Good luck to Ron Moses out west. I don't know where you're headed to. Safe travels, buddy. Be safe. Be safe going out. Be safe coming back. Uh. Good comment tonight. Absolutely. Eric, thanks for tuning in and adding comments in as well. Yeah, Adam Wynn was on too. Adam's been fishing a lot lately. I've seen pics. So. Right? So, yeah. So, uh, next week. Next week, we got Ed Gramza from Base Map on. And we'll be on Thursday night. We'll be back to our regular night. Yeah, and that'll be our last show. For two weeks. For two weeks. Because 4th of July week, we're not going to do a show because it's 4th of July week and we're traveling. We're not going to be around. So, so, but yeah, next week, base map. Uh, we're going to be talking about new features on base map. And actually, uh, I was using base map on our last two kayaking excursions. Okay. So, doing some mapping and uh, tracking with that and pretty cool stuff. So, I'll, I'll try to grab some uh, screen grabs from some of the stuff that I did and we can kind of talk about that on the show as well. But, Sounds yeah. like a deal. So, but Ed will be on with us from Wisconsin. So, if everything goes correct. Right. <laughs> so, 
All right. Uh, thanks, Eric. Appreciate it, man. Uh, we, we try. We try to do a good show every week, in and out. And Sometimes it's a little discombobulated. And but yep. But thanks to Arizona, we had something to talk about, and tonight. we got a soapbox out. So, all right. For those of you on the podcast, uh, if you would do, give us a, a like, follow, and share. You know, appreciate it if you guys share the show. Help us out. Helps our supporters out who support us. If you're listening over on iTunes. Uh, be sure to drop us a review over there. That helps us as well. So uh, we see you guys again next Thursday night. That'd be July 1st, I do believe. Yes, so, that will be July 1. And Tom Genzel says, stay off my secret spot. <laughs> there you go. Stay out of my woods. <laughs> Good night, Ron Moses. <laughs> all right. So those of y'all on the podcast, we'll see y'all again next week. This episode was brought to you by PSE Archery, Yamaha Outboards, Better the Hunt, Easy Cut, Packer Max, Deer Camp Coffee, Buck Baits, JPO Game Calls, Limwalker Game Calls, Wild Seasoning, Total Peep, Sunrise Archery, Scent Lock, and Scent Blocker. Thanks for listening and join us again here next week. Until then, remember, as we always like to say, if you're out on the water or in the woods, shoot straight and be safe until next week on the Up North Journal. Thank you.